so I'm going to talk about coherent evolution. Uh, in terms of an agenda, uh, I'm going to first uh, try and explain in a couple of slides what we mean by coherent optical uh, in terms of you know what came before uh, and what changed with coherent optical. Then we're going to look inside a coherent optical engine, look at the key building blocks, one of which is the uh, silicon based uh, uh, DSP. Uh, another key building block is the photonics. Uh, and we'll take a look at how uh, the the silicon technology, uh, the CMOS technology is evolving, and that's one of the key enablers for coherent evolution. And we'll also take a look at how the photonics technology uh, is uh, is and has been uh, evolving uh, as another key enabler. Uh, and then we'll look at, look at the three key ways that we can use those technology enablers to evolve coherent. There's really three vectors, and I'll talk about those three vectors. Uh, and I'll also talk about how different types of optical engines prioritize these three vectors differently. So um, in my attempt to explain what we mean by coherent optics, it's probably uh, best to try and understand uh, what, what we had before coherent optics. So for 2.5 gig and 10 gig DWDM wavelengths, uh, we use direct detect, um, uh, direct detect on the receiver side and we use pretty simple modulation, either on-off keying or non-return to zero, where you had uh, uh, two uh, power levels. Uh, but basically, it was pretty simple. You either turn the light uh, on or off by, by using the modulator, um, and then you detected uh, the light was either on or off at the other end. Uh, you know, there were some challenges uh, when we got to 10 gig with going beyond 10 gig. One of these related to uh, dispersion, uh, and these are uh, a couple of optical effects that we see. Uh, firstly, chromatic dispersion, where the different frequencies within the wavelength um, move at slightly different speeds through the fiber, and that causes the signal to blur. That's chromatic dispersion. And then you also have polarization mode dispersion, uh, where the light travels uh, slightly different speeds on the different polarizations that you have of light. Uh, and particularly for chromatic dispersion, where you have a squared relationship between the amount of chromatic dispersion uh, and the symbol rate, that is the number of symbols per second uh, or the board rate. Uh, you also had some challenges scaling the electronics to go to faster and faster uh, speeds because your only way of doing that was just to send more symbols per second. So kind of starting in 2008, the uh, industry uh, moved towards uh, coherent optical and coherent optical is a little bit different. So for one thing, uh, we're using the two polarizations of light independently and we're sending um, uh, half the information on one polarization and the other half of the information on the other polarization. Uh, we're also using uh, phase and amplitude. So initially it was just phase. Uh, but uh, uh, then as we move to uh, uh, more bits per symbol with uh, uh, more advanced QAM, which actually came from the, the wireless side of the world, uh, we then we use both phase and amplitude, and you can see 16 QAM there. Uh, uh, but the price we paid for this is we had a much more uh, complicated uh, uh, system uh, in terms of the transmitter, uh, both in terms of the uh, the the uh, digital signal processing uh, and in terms of the photonics. Uh, initially, it was just a, a digital signal processor on the receive side, but then uh, as the coherent technology advanced, we also needed digital signal processing on the transmit side. So this has taken us from 40 gig to 100 gig. There are actually two generations of 100 gig, uh, as I'll, I'll talk a little bit later, then 200 gig wavelengths, 400 gig wavelengths, 600 gig wavelengths. And then today's state of the art uh, is 800 gig uh, on an uh, individual wavelength. So coherent technology had a, a couple of uh, big benefits. The first was we got much better uh, wavelength capacity reach. So for a given uh, amount of wavelength capacity, we could go a lot further. Uh, and we also got much better spectral efficiency. We got more bits uh, in every uh, hertz of bandwidth, uh, and that increased uh, the fiber capacity so we can get more uh, bandwidth out of the fiber. Uh, also with Coherent, we're now solving problems uh, that were um, um, optical problems that were previously solved in the analog domain. We're now able to solve them, things like dispersion and nonlinearities, 
uh, in the digital domain on the DSP, and that led to simpler uh, optical infrastructure. So, for example, uh, we, we no longer need dispersion compensation modules, uh, which were uh, kind of a pain to plan and install. Uh, so where is coherent optical used? Well, initially it was used primarily for, for long haul and subsea, where the uh, capacity reach, particularly the reach uh, and the spectral efficiency were especially valued. Uh, in the metro where uh, traffic, uh, individual traffic uh, flows tend to be smaller, it, uh, and the distances are shorter. Uh, coherent uh, took a uh, kind of came later, um, but we now have a lot of coherent in, in the metro, particularly with coherent uh, pluggables. There is still some direct detect, uh, particularly in the in the metro edge, and uh, also in kind of uh, parts of the metro where there's lower traffic requirements. So if we look at the, the revenues, and this is the market for WDM interfaces, uh, what we see is the bulk of the revenues now uh, for WDM interfaces are coherent. Uh, you can see the dark blue there uh, is coherent embedded. That's where the coherent engine is uh, on a module. Uh, and the, the lighter blue is uh, uh, coherent pluggables. You can see the direct detect starting to uh, really shrink. Uh, and this is a revenue view. If you look at a, a bandwidth view, then you'll see the vast majority, almost 99% of the bandwidth on optical networks now is coherent. OK, so now let's look inside a uh, coherent optical engine or coherent transceiver. Uh, so what you see if you look inside, uh, and this is a kind of simplified diagram, uh, is you see three key building blocks. Uh, the first building block is the digital ASIC uh, or DSP. Uh, it's lot, it, you quite often hear this referred to as the DSP, uh, though it actually contains a lot more functions than just the DSP. It also, include, also includes things like the digital analog converter, the analog to digital converter, and a whole bunch of other functions uh, that we'll talk about later. So that's one of the key building blocks. The other key building block is the photonics. Uh, and in the case of Infinera, we use a photonic integrated circuit. Uh, and this includes things like a, a transmit laser, uh, the modulator uh, that puts the uh, signal, that puts the information onto the wavelength. And then on the receive side, we also have a laser uh, that uh, uh, tunes to the frequency we're receiving. We have some passive photonics, and then we have photodetectors that uh, detect the light and convert that to uh, current. And then in between the digital ASIC DSP and the photonics, we have the analog electronics. So that's the, uh, the drivers that convert the low voltage from the DAC to the high voltage needed to power the modulator, uh, and the transimpedance amplifiers that take the, the current from the photodetectors and convert it to voltage that can be understood by the digital ASIC. Uh, and the, the digital ASIC DSP is enabled by silicon CMOS technology, the same uh, silicon CMOS technology that powers your smartphone, that powers uh, your, your, your laptop uh, and, and servers and, and uh, your games console. So we'll talk about that uh, in a little more detail now. OK, so I would imagine pretty much everybody on this call has heard of Moore's Law. Um, you know, this was a prediction by Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, uh, in 1965, that the number of transistors in a given unit of area on a chip would double every 18 to 24 months. And this has largely held true for the last 50 years. It's taken us from just over 2,000 transistors on the first Intel uh, processor so now, if you look at uh, Apple's uh, M1 Max in their, uh, their high-end uh, uh, desktop computers, you've got 57 billion transistors. And if you're lucky enough to have a, a, an iPhone 13, the, the chip in that, the Apple A15, uh, has 15 billion transistors. So a, a huge uh, scaling in terms of the number of transistors, uh, in terms of the processing power, uh, and uh, similar reductions in terms of the, uh, the cost and the power consumption. Uh, so what happens with CMOS technology is every uh, two to three years, there's a, a new uh, major uh, process node. And this is kind of showing a chart for TSMC, which is the world's leading uh, uh, foundry. Um, so in 2008, they introduced 14 nanometer, 2011, 28 nanometer, 2015, 16 nanometer. Then we had seven nanometer, uh, 2020 was five nanometer, and then we're expecting it in 2023 
they're expecting to introduce three nanometer. Uh, and each generation, every time we have this transition, we get uh, an improvement in terms of the performance, uh, in terms of the power consumption. And, and the figures you see there are one or the other. So it's, uh, uh, so for example, when we went from 65 nanometers to 40 nanometers, we had a 30% improvement in terms of the performance or we had a 50% uh, reduction in terms of the power consumption, uh, and you also had a, 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 an improvement in terms of the density. Uh, a number of you listening might be wondering what we mean by nanometers when we talk about five nanometers or seven nanometers or three nanometers. Uh, and the reality is this is really a marketing term these days. It no longer represents anything to do with the geometry of the silicon, such as the gate length. Uh, back in the day, uh, it used to represent uh, uh, something, but really now it's just a marketing term uh, and it bundles together a bunch of improvements uh, in the that you get in the uh, silicon uh, generations. Uh, so a little bit like 4G or 5G or 6G on the mobile side. Uh, so it's still, it's still used, you'll still hear about two nanometer and uh, 1.1 nanometer, whatever comes after two nanometers. So, so this, the industry still uses this nanometer term, but it doesn't actually mean anything uh, uh, physical related to the chip. Now, if you do some research into Moore's law and uh, uh, silicon technology evolution, uh, you'll you'll read an equal number of articles that say Moore's law is dead or dying, uh, and then you'll read articles that uh, you know say it's going to go on for another fifty years, powered by quantum computing or whatever the latest and greatest technology is. Um, but uh, uh, the IEEE publishes a report every year. Uh, this is called Moore Moore. Uh, and you can download this from the IEEE. It's, it's, it's not behind a paywall. Uh, and this provides a, a roadmap for silicon technology uh, going through to 2034 on what they call 0 0.7 nanometer. So there's, uh, uh, so there's a, a path here for the silicon technology to keep improving for at least the next decade or so. Um, now, Every time you turn on the news these days, you hear something about the uh, uh, the, the chip shortage, uh, how it's impacting, uh, uh, you know, how, how you can't get a new car. Uh, uh, there's there's uh, shortages of uh, mobile phones and laptops and everything else that is powered by chips. And to understand this, it's kind of interesting to understand a little bit about the semiconductor manufacturing ecosystem. And what I'm showing here is the kind of ecosystem um, for companies that don't have their own semiconductor fab. So if you're Intel and you're vertically integrated and have your own uh, fab, this doesn't really apply to you so much. Uh, but for everybody else, so companies like uh, Infinera, um, uh, which is pretty much every, uh, with a very few exceptions, nobody has their own uh, foundry, and you'll see why in a couple of slides time. Then if you want to get the latest chips, then you go to a foundry company, and if you want the, the high-end uh, latest uh, CMOS process nodes, that's primarily TSMC in Taiwan, uh, and to a lesser extent, you can get a Samsung, um, Samsung they get electronics, and then there's a few other uh, foundries that do uh, the maybe the older process nodes. Uh, now, these foundries, uh, they get the equipment to manufacture these chips from uh, companies like ASML in the Netherlands, uh, Applied Materials, LAM Research, KLA and Teradyne in the US, Tokyo Electron from Japan. Uh, they buy uh, wafers and a lot of other materials. Um, you, you get specialist mask shops that, that create the masks. Uh, you have companies like uh, um, uh, Synopsys and Cadence and Mentographics that provide the design software to design these chips. And then you have companies that provide what's called standard cells, which are some standard building blocks uh, um, or intellectual property so that you're not designing every chip from scratch. So, for example, ARM, which is probably uh, well known here in the UK, uh, that's what they do. They create uh, uh, standard cells for um, that you would use in a chip. So, you know, there's uh, 50 plus classes of very highly engineered precision equipment. Uh, each, each, each of those uh, uh, pieces of equipment will contain hundreds of subsystems. Uh, and there's 300 plus uh, different inputs that go into making a chip. So it's a very complex uh, process. And this is why we're having challenges at the moment in terms of scaling up uh, chip manufacturing and why there's uh, constraints. <laughs> 
Uh, so just to kind of explain, uh, you know, how this works in a little more detail, the cost of uh, building a fab is, is huge and it increases significantly with every generation. So a 16 nanometer fab was between three and five billion. Seven nanometer fab is about seven billion. Uh, five nanometer fab is uh, uh, 12 to 17 billion. And for three nanometers, I think TSMC are talking about 20 billion plus uh, for their uh, large state of the art three nanometer fabs. Uh, as a result of this, it's all driven by uh, product volumes. So uh, if we look at the the, equi the equipment that wants to use those fabs, um, then you, you've got smartphones with, with kind of billions, you've got laptop uh, CPUs with uh, uh, hundreds of millions, uh, and then you've got routers with millions and coherent ports with uh, you know hundreds of thousands or, or tens of thousands, depending on the on the segment. So what happens is the the high end smartphone chips essentially justify the investment in the fab. They essentially pay for the fab, and then everybody else gets their turn after the uh, smart smartphone chips. <coughs> So when TSMC comes out with its latest process node, um, when the three nanometer, uh, then you know the first products that will be powered by that will probably be the Apple uh, um, uh, smartphone, iPhone smart, iPhone chips, and then six or twelve months later, uh, then that tends to move to the graphics processing units uh, and the CPUs. Uh, and then six to 12 months after that, uh, coherent optical and switching and routing uh, gets their turn. So if we look at um, coherent optics and, and silicon evolution, what we see is a very tight correlation between the CMOS process node uh, and the coherent uh, generation. So with 100 gig, uh, the first generation of 100 gig with hard decision FEC, that used 65 nanometer, then with soft decision FEC, moved to 40 nanometer. Uh, 200 gig and 400 gig used 28 nanometer, then 600 gig used 16 nanometer, uh, and then 800 gig, uh, today's kind of state of the art with Infineris i6, uh, uses seven nanometer CMOS technology. <coughs> Uh, and what we see here is with each generation, there's a, typically a big increase in the number of transistors per DSP or per digital ASIC. Uh, so we went from uh, less than 100 million to hundreds of millions to 1.6 billion to 2.5 billion. Uh, and now with Infineris i6, there's five plus billion uh, transistors on that digital ASIC. Uh, and those more transistors gives you more processing power that enables you to do advanced optical features. So for example, in I6, we have things like probabilistic constellation shaping and Nyquist subcarriers and dynamic bandwidth allocation uh, and advanced forward error correction. And all this requires a lot of processing power. Um, and to do that, you need lots of transistors uh, and, uh, uh, and the smallest possible process node. A second uh, uh, technology uh, enabler uh, alongside the, the silicon CMOS evolution is photonic integration. And this is something that Infinera uh, has pioneered. Uh, so if we look in the uh, if we look at the photonics part of the optical engine, uh, what we've done is we've shrunk uh, we've shrunk the photonics by putting multiple optical functions. Uh, lasers, modulators, uh, uh, various types of uh, passive components, uh, photo detectors, uh, all into one, uh, all into one photonic integrated circuit. Uh, there are two platforms today for, uh, for for photonic integration. One is indium phosphide, which uh, Infinero was a pioneer of, uh, and the other is silicon photonics, and they each have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, indium phosphide has two main advantages. The first is that as a, a material, indium phosphide can provide gain, so you can use it for a laser and an amplifier. Uh, and the second key benefit for, uh, for indium phosphide is it has a superior physical effect for the modulator. So that gives you better performance uh, and lower loss. So those are the kind of two key advantages uh, for indium phosphide. And we believe indium phosphide has advantages for both high-end uh, embedded optical engines, particularly with the modulator performance. Uh, 
And then on the pluggables, we think there's a big advantage that I'll talk about in, in a couple of slides time uh, from having the ability to do uh, particularly the amplification built into the pick. Uh, for silicon photonics, you have to use an external laser and you have to use external amplification. You can do the photo detector by integrating germanium. Uh, the big advantage for silicon photonics is that if you don't already own an indium phosphide fab, then you can leverage legacy CMOS fab, uh, a legacy CMOS fab to manufacture uh, those uh, uh, silicon photonics circuits. Uh, so one question I get asked is, well, if uh, if the photonics is is being done with silicon photonics and the digital ASIC is also being done with silicon, why can't you just build uh, one chip uh, for both the digital ASIC and the photonic integrated circuit? And there's a couple of answers to that. One is that you you also need the analog electronics, which is typically another material like silicon germanium. Uh, but the other answer is, is that uh, the digital ASIC and the photonic integrated circuit use completely different CMOS process nodes. So with the digital ASIC DSP, you really want to use the state of the art smallest uh, CMOS process node to get more processing power, higher board rates, better performance, lower power consumption uh, and reduce the footprint. With the photonic integrated circuit, you're kind of limited by the properties of light and the properties of the, uh, of the material to uh, impact the light. Uh, so silicon photonics is typically done with 90 nanometer to 40 nanometer CMOS. Uh, there's also some 130 nanometer that's used for prototypes. Uh, and you don't really get any benefit or a very minimal benefit from going to a smaller process node. Um, and there's a big increase in cost, so it just doesn't justify the cost. So to give you an example with the modulator, the phase change is a function of its length uh, and voltage. So shrinking that, uh, doesn't help. You can't you can't shrink the modulator. Uh, so if we look now at these uh, uh, these coherent uh, uh, technology evolution enablers and how we can use them, particularly the silicon, there are really three ways we can we can use those technology improvements. Uh, the first is we can build a bigger, more powerful DSP, leveraging uh, the, uh, the the processing power uh, and reduced footprint and power consumption of the latest CMOS node. Uh, and we can use that uh, not only to have the highest board rate, but to do advanced optical features that are very processor intensive, things like Nyquist subcarriers, long code word probabilistic constellation shaping, uh, advanced forward error correction. So that's one way we can leverage this. Uh, another way is we can build a smaller DSP that has low power consumption and low footprint and put it into a pluggable form factor so we can minimize space and power. Uh, and then the third way we can leverage this is we can take that additional processing power that, that we have uh, and instead of using it for advanced optical features, we can integrate systems level functions that were previously sat uh, on the shelf uh, or the uh, or, or the card and put them into the digital ASIC so that we can get it uh, into the optical engine. So just to kind of explain a little bit about the performance versus space and power. So if we look at a, a 400 gig pluggable uh, coherent DSP today, it typically has about 1.5 billion transistors. Uh, and you run that in different modes depending on the application. So you could put it into a QSF PDD for 400ZR and run it in a low power mode. You could put it into a CFP2 for ZR plus, uh, 400ZR plus and put it into a, a high power mode. So when we put that into uh, a QSF PDD uh, where we're limited to 16 to 20 watts, uh, if we have silicon photonics, uh, then we typically have low transmit power and high out of band noise. Or if we put it into a CFP2, we've got more footprint, so we can put in a little micro amplifier, a micro EDFA, and a tunable optical filter, and then we can have high transmit power uh, and low out of band noise. Uh, but what we can do with indium phosphide is because we can integrate uh, a semiconductor optical amplifier into the indium phosphide pick, even in a QSF PDD form factor. Uh, we can get high transmit power uh, and low out of band noise. Now then if we look at uh, uh, an embe embedded optical engine like Infineros I6, we've got 5 billion transistors. Because we're going onto a module um, and not into a pluggable, uh, 
uh, we've got uh, we're not so constrained by space and power, so we can have a, a larger uh, EDFA. We can have a tuner optical filter, and we can get the highest transmit power uh, and low out of that noise in addition to all the performance benefits. Then if we look at the vector C in a little more detail, if we look at a, a modern coherent uh, digital ASIC like Infineros i6, not only does it include the uh, receive and transmit DSPs, it also includes the uh, ADC and DAC, the forward error correction, framing, multiplexing and encryption. Uh, and with this vector, uh, what we're what we're doing, and we'll, we'll 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 see this when we talk about XR optics in a couple of slides time, is what we're now doing is taking shelf level functions that would have previously lived on the controller card, uh, and card level functions, and putting them into the uh, into the digital ASIC that goes into the coherent pluggable. And we'll we'll talk about the benefits of that uh, in a couple of slides time. OK, so uh, in terms of these vectors, uh, there are a number of different ways you can prioritize these vectors. If it's an embedded optical engine, it, they, they typically prioritize the performance vector. Uh, for coherent pluggables, uh, different pluggables will prioritize these vectors differently. So uh, one pluggable uh, may really just focus on minimizing space and power. Uh, a second pluggable will also maybe trade off a little bit of, uh, of the power consumption to get better performance. Uh, and another pluggable may try and balance uh, space and power uh, performance uh, uh, whilst integrating more systems level functions. So to give you uh, two examples of this, if we look at Infinera's i6 embedded optical engine, what we're really trying to do is get the best possible capacity reach uh, by maximizing the performance with an ultra high board rate that's uh, 96 giga board and we just uh, announced a 100 giga board version of this i6 turbo uh, having very high uh, modem SNR that's minimizing the amount of noise inside the engine uh, long code were probabilistic constellation shaping second generation Nyquist subcarriers SD effect gain sharing uh, and so on so really trying to maximize the performance uh, that's not to say that we we don't also uh, reduce space and power, um, particularly uh, we're trying to reduce the watts per gig per kilometer uh, and integrating some systems level functions like telemetry uh, and encryption. Then if we look at uh, XR optics uh, uh, and uh, ISEXR is Infinera's uh, uh, brand for, ISEC, for uh, XR optics, uh, then what we're trying to do is kind of balance these three vectors. So we get uh, space and power that can go into uh, small form factor pluggables like CFP2 and QSFPDD. We're also putting in some advanced optical features like digital subcarriers, uh, as well as um, having a high transmit power and low out of band noise uh, and having uh, the option for single fiber. Uh, and then we've also put in a lot of systems level functions, things like VLAN awareness, spectrum analyzer, uh, topology awareness, encryption, inbound communications and remote management. Uh, and what that enables to do is to do with the digital subcarriers uh, and the uh, systems level functions is in addition to being able to do very high performance point to point coherent, we can also do point to multipoint uh, with digital subcarrier aggregation. So at a, a hub site, we can have a single pluggable uh, that is taking these 25 gig uh, subcarriers uh, from multiple spokes uh, and aggregating them optically. And that can lead to up to 70% reductions in total cost of ownership. Uh, the second thing we can do leveraging the systems level functions that we've integrated uh, into ISEXR is we can put this into a router, uh, manage it uh, via inbound communications, uh, and really treat this as a virtual transponder. So providing uh, demarcation, even though it's uh, inside a third party router. <laughs> Uh, so to summarize, uh, the CMOS process node improvements and photonic integration are enabling coherent technology to evolve. Uh, we can leverage these technology improvements in three ways. We can maximize the performance, we can minimize the space and power, or we can integrate systems level functions. An optical engine design uh, involves trading off between these three vectors. 
So individual optical engines prioritize these three vectors differently. So an embedded engine like Infineros i6 prioritizes performance. Whereas with uh, Infineros i6R XR optics pluggable, we're trying to balance space and power. Uh, we've put some advanced optical features there like digital subcarriers. We've integrated a lot of systems level functions that that enables us to do things like point to multipoint coherence uh, and virtual transponder. Uh, and you'll be able to see demonstrations of XR optics in Astral Park uh, from April of this year. Uh, if you want more information, there's an Infinera white paper called Pluggables, Embeddeds, and the Three Vectors of Coherent Evolution that uh, goes into more detail on all of the topics uh, I've talked about this morning. Uh, and you can download that from the Infinera website. Uh, and you can also contact me, uh, pmontahan at infinera.com.